Well, I uh, just thought we'd start by talking about your latest project. Uh, why was California gold shelved the way it was, and it's uh, and why now to resurrect it? Well, uh, the uh, the original group uh, was uh, basically uh, I asked Donald Duck Dunn uh, if he knew of any singers out there because I was looking to put a band together. And he said, yes, uh, I do. And he says, Bobby Whitlock. And I said, that name's familiar. And Derek and the Dominoes. And, and uh, uh, he said, yeah, OK. Um, why don't we check in with him? So we did. And he was looking to do something as well. And uh, so uh, we uh, got together and started out seeing how we could uh, work as a te writing team. And that was really easy, and uh, and we were pretty prolific in terms of a product that we were we were uh, putting out or planned to put out. And I said, we we better uh, we better record this stuff or we'll forget it. And uh, that 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 is a truism uh, for writers. You know, if you have an idea, write it down or get up out of bed if you don't get out of bed when you have one of these it's gone in the morning so anyway uh, we uh, went in to several studios and uh, uh, and uh, duck said well i've got a uh, i'm sorry but i can't uh, do the, this project i've been offered uh, a, a deal with the blues brothers with the uh, Ackroyd and the belushi and and of course, I, we said, "Oh, I'll take that! You're going to be a movie star, and uh, he, he's one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet." And, and so, you know, that character and, and it, that worked. And then uh, uh, some of the, some of the others were uh, uh, looking at other 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 th projects as things were changing on our side. And so, uh, we just said, "Well, you know." Uh, I'll put this away, and uh, we'll uh, everyone goes their their uh, separate di direction. And so I had the had the multi tracks, and, and I, I knew that uh, there was good uh, uh, good things on 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 that uh, real. And so I I mixed it all all down and and uh, produced the. The, all the, the the various tracks from different uh, studios and that's what you're listening to uh, when you hear the uh, the California gold uh, and uh, it, it was time to come out that was about it last year uh, I had been putting some things out with the things I did with Steve Wright and some other folks and myself so, uh, well, there's another one, and this one's probably the best of the lot. So uh, it, uh, it was time to put it out. Cool. How long did it take to get all this together, to cobble all the tapes together? You recorded this in, in several different studios, as you were saying? Yes. Well, uh, that, part was, that part was pretty easy because I had to bake uh, the tapes uh, because they were 40 years old, and uh, there's a process uh, for your listeners uh you you bake it at a, at a low temperature and then you have a short window to get the information from that procedure onto a digital tape and that's what we did and i got several other things that uh, were uh, put through that uh, process and uh, uh, all of it came out and uh, that is amazing. The, th the, the, the downside to it is they're all, I don't have the multi-tracks, so I have two tracks, uh, two track mas masters. And I was able to, through the, through the uh, w wisdom of technology and, and my old buddy, Ru Russell DeShiel, we uh, uh, were able to uh, come up with, uh, change those those uh, two tracks to uh, what we wanted to have as a finished product. And uh, I could tell Russell, I want this, I want that, I want this. And lo and behold, the, the next day, uh, there it would be. He's, he's really uh, uh, 
my, my partner in, in, in this, and uh, uh, he's, uh, he's also a really good lead guitar player. And uh, but all all the guitars were pretty much already in in uh, in place. So uh, that's how that went. Yeah, fascinating. Ten songs that were uh, just resurrected like that, and you co-wrote all of them, or some of them, uh, with Bobby Whitlock. All of them. Everything that comes out of my vault, I'm either the writer or co-writer on. Uh, that's that's one of the the, uh, the 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 rules that I have for myself. Um, you know, if you're going to go to the trouble and, and expense of uh, mixing records, that uh, and when I when I go into a, 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 a mixing situation. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't just do a half-ass job because it's a demo. That uh, that's the one you want to do. I, I, so I go in w with the uh, w the guys of making a master uh, that's going to be put out, and uh, and it's, it's it's paid off through the years, and uh, that's what's happened here. Yeah, yeah, and got some good bass on there by Donald Duck Don. That's just, it's totally prominent throughout your, uh, the entire release. Was it always being called California Gold, or did you come up with that title later? Well, no, that was the name of our band, and then, uh, you know, the, we didn't have internet back then, so it was hard to search things, and uh, somebody somewhere told us <laughs> too late, you know, they had the name, and uh uh, and uh, so we said, well, if it's yours, it's yours. We'll come up with something else. Well, we didn't come up with something else. So I thought it would be, a, it has a nice sound to it, California Gold. We were in California at the time. And uh, so we thought, well, why don't we just name the, the uh, album uh, California Gold and, and uh, let people figure it out. Yeah, yeah, that's that's just the way to go. It's just you know, always stick with it. Got some great tracks on there. Good times. That's uh just really I like the gravelly vocals. It's just very soulful. It's amazing to see that this was done in the seventies, and there was a lot of good stuff there under all that popular disco stuff. I mean, there were people doing some really, really good original, uh, fascinating stuff. It kind of reminds me a little bit of a Doobie Brothers kind of a thing too, as well. Oh, that's a compliment. I'm really close with the Dubes. Yeah. Uh, they're also a Bay Area band, and John McPhee is one of my best friends uh, anywhere. So, uh, yeah, that's a nice compliment. Yeah, it just really gets new. It's a groovy, open track, and it just it just go, it takes off from there. It's just uh, it's just amazing that something like that was shelved for more than four decades. But is that is it pretty uncommon in the business to like shelve an entire project like that? You hear about it every now and then. Yeah, that's about it. Now every now and then, no, it's not a, a common uh, thing to do. Uh, uh, of course, with the the baking process. Uh, I, I, when I think of baking, I think of brownies, and yeah, when I think of brownies, I think of baking. So yeah, why would you do something physically to the tape like that in order to get the performance out of it? That's kind of interesting because we don't really hear about that kind of stuff when they do all these remasters, these big box sets, and things like that. That that's a very interesting process. It certainly is. Yeah, and then uh, going through the digital processing uh, was it like something like Pro Tools or something on that level where somebody's just really going through and just sweetening everything. How how is that process? Well, that's uh, we did use Pro Tools, uh, and uh, you know we used it uh, for some compression. You want compression when you're in the mastering uh, area, um, and 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 EQ different frequencies in other words if i wanted to bring, get the drums uh, uh the snare drum is 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 low on on the recording for whatever reason that's that's what was what i what i did uh that you find that frequency and then you boost that frequency uh and that's 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 going to bring bring the level of the drum up and then you can put a little compression on it to give it that 
that, that, that sock. The problem with that is that in everything else that's in that frequency is going to be boosted as well. And that's where the art and science collide. And uh, uh, a guy like Russell uh, understands it and uh, was able to get the maximum amount of all, uh, everything we did with that particular step. Mm. Yeah, pure gold. It really is. Uh, how is the songwriting process? How does that work when you have a co-writer? Do you come up with certain lines? The co-writer, you just trade off or you write the whole thing. Maybe the co-writer revises it. Yeah, a little, a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, usually in a co-write situation, uh, one uh, individual has something that the other guy doesn't have. And the other guy has something that the uh, other guy doesn't have, and uh, that that's that's the whole point of collaboration. Uh, but I I won't write with any more than one person. Uh, you know, two is a company, three is a crowd, and you start people start thinking about uh, numbers of lines or words or whatever and, and, and might have a direction they they think it should go and the other guys don't and uh and, and the one that always gets me is well i have i've i've got a, a whole verse out of these these songs so i should get i should get uh uh, 75 percent wait, wait a minute we're making we're, we're this is this is art we're dealing with here there's a way to to, to do it and and uh the, the the best way to do it is the most expedient way is to get it get the idea that that first comes comes to your to your to your head and uh and heart and, and then you you develop from there things develop uh, I'm 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 pri primarily the the lyricist because I'm a, I'm a drummer so I'm not playing actual chords or and uh, Bobby's got that that B three organ so uh, usually uh, he he would come up with the the music and I would take that that music home uh, with me or if I was writing at home uh, just say hold on a minute this shouldn't take too long and you gave me a nice piece of music to work with so uh, that's how it works but then there are, uh, there are uh, I have an album called uh, Magic Window and on, on, on that album I, I wrote three of the songs with just by myself so I can do it and I, I'll use the piano for, for chords I, I don't play the piano but I use it as a tool to you know to, to put melodies and, and things together but I, I enjoy the process of working with somebody else, one other person who is unselfish and, and uh, willing to, uh, to uh, you know, put something out there and put it in, put it in the oven and see what we get. Uh, uh, and the same thing with Steve Wright. Uh, that, that's what we did in, in that album. Uh, we co-wrote everything and uh, I... Uh, I was very active with uh, coming up with uh, ideas. Uh, we would go into a rehearsal place and uh, just take a, a little cassette, audio cassette, and put it in the room. And sometimes, you know, you, he, had, he would have his guitar and I, you know, I have a drum set in there. Sometimes it, the, the thing would start with a drum groove, you know, here, 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 put something to this, boom, you know, you got that, oh, I like that, okay. Mm. You know, those are the, the, the ways, there's no uh, set way that you, you do it this, the same way every time. There are, because ideas come at different times of the night and day, and, and uh, sometimes you're with that other person, sometimes you're not. So you just uh, you, you just take what you have and, uh, and embellish it uh, to uh, uh, make it a, make it turn it into a song to, to to begin with, and they don't all they don't all pass muster either. Sure, you know, sure. I, I, I I had it, but I, now I forgot the, the you know half of the hook, and that's what I wanted. These are the things 
Yeah, that uh, songwriters, especially when you're working with somebody else, you've got to grab the the good and and get it uh, on your note taker, that that little tape machine, and then you can take that home with you and and try different uh, different melodies and different uh, different uh, lyrics. You know, I can do do mel- as long as I have chords. To, to build a melody around it, well, I can do that. That's, you know, and I, I can do the chord thing, but it's nothing like a guy that, you know, that can play guitar or, or keyboards like Steve does and Bobby does. And uh, um, it, it's it's really fun to take thin air mm-hmm. and then applause and put, pull some ideas out, out of it uh, from, from the head and the heart. And the next thing you know, uh, you have a song. It's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, very collaborative process. So uh, was it like that in CCR? Was that same process or was it just like, no, just we got our lyricist here, does the melodies, lyrics, and we all just come together after that? Well, yeah, in CCR, we couldn't, we, we couldn't submit anything. It was John's deal and... Oh, yeah. <laughs> John used to be a singer and a songwriter and all of it, and he he he, he gave it up for for John's voice, and but not 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 ever thinking that he would wouldn't be able to sing a song. He was a true tenor and a soft tenor, like a Richie Valens. Yeah, and we did a lot of covers. He could have done it. I, John, and I had a lot of arguments over that. Over fighting with Tom and Stu was involved in that too, but uh, it was me more than than anybody because uh, I'm not a guitar player, and that, that gives me uh, an edge. Uh, I could, you know, made it uh, easy for me to come up with the drum parts. John would come in and say, "Here's this, here's this. You play that," and then I would take it home, put it on my little multi-track machine, and go. No, I can I can come up with something better than that, and uh, but you know the other three guys are all guitar players. So when he tells them to do something, it's, it's easier for them to digest it and uh, and do it. But I would always want to improve on on the the, the drum parts. Uh, Susie Q, for example, was a rockabilly song, uh, and I never liked it. <laughs> <laughs> So wanted to get away from rock and belly. No, we were playing in the bars back then, and so that's uh, five, six nights a week, five sets a night, and so you, you know you want to work on your material, so you want to stretch songs out, and you want to make the beats danceable because the uh, economics of of, 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 of uh, bars are you get a if you're going to pay for a band. Have, make sure that they understand that you want those people dancing because then they sweat and then they need a beer. <laughs> beer bought, sure. there's, your, there's your economics, uh, bar uh, uh, economics. So I, I changed that, that beat with my right hand. Instead of going like this on the cymbal, I made it a quarter note, boom, boom. And the in between, that leaves a lot of space. So I put the eighth notes. Uh, oh. they're, they're with my with my right foot on the bass drum. So it, it created a, a back and forth, and and it opened up the the uh, the, the the track. So the guitars just really come come out in in that record. Same with Born on the Bayou. It's, it's a quarter note song. Uh, and uh, it, it it just makes things better. Less is best. It gives that sp- a space for the melody to work, and uh, the, the some of the the licks that were being played. So yeah, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's a very very uh, catchy, simple, and it really works as a, as a whole. Um, yeah. <laughs> It really, really does. And having that collaborative process is just uh, really amazing. Like some some artists will talk about somebody like Elton John. I mean, he, he doesn't want to write lyrics, but he comes up with the melody. And uh, it's, it's nice to be able to divide that up. Yeah, that's 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 true. And uh, that's uh, that's kind of uh, one of the the uh, 
the rules for me is the guy has to have uh, uh, hooks, guitar hooks, little hooks, or you can, you know, uh, a guitar part like as black as black and uh, things like uh, that nature. And, and then sometimes it's gray. So, uh, but uh, I have a fellow that I work with or haven't in a while, but I, when I did my solo album, it, we I wrote uh, four songs with him for the, on, that, on that album. And because he always, he would come in and have a little guitar, just a, a, a lick, you know, a two bar lick. And then boom, I said, that's, that's mine now. <laughs> <laughs> And I can, you know, I can put together something that uh, works with that lick and take advantage of it. And, and a lot of times, instead of a vocal hook, hook uh, uh, a little guitar lick, and, and sometimes a keyboard lick, Bob, Bobby's uh, pretty good on that. And, uh, you know, we just had a, a, a an understanding of what we were trying to do and it didn't matter if one guy wrote three quarters of a song and uh, and uh, but on the next one uh, that that gets flipped around it all add, adds up to where it, it it's, it's a, a 50 50 deal it's it's not uh, it's just like Lennon and McCartney yeah. those guys some sometimes they wrote songs by, by themselves but the, it, that was their writing uh, uh, mechanism, and, and uh, th th that's how how they did it. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, one of the best songwriting teams ever. That's for oh. sure. But I, I like those kind of a track like Layla, which just has these different sections to it. It's like you could just tell you know a lot of it's a melange of ideas, and I just like how the layering of that. Yeah, it's it's really beautiful. Coming back to California Gold. Uh, you recorded in San Francisco. Is was always called the Cosmos Factory. Uh, that was actually in Berkeley, and it was always called Cosmos Factory. I had a little uh, gardener's shack in my backyard. That we be, this was before we had a hit, and uh, it was a, we couldn't use Tom's garage anymore because the the cops had been called <laughs> many times. And the the last time the cop came, he says, if I "Come back again. You're going to jail." <laughs> okay well so i had this little gardener shack it was maybe 12 feet by by six feet it was just we were just packed in there and this guy's all everybody smoked cigarettes in the band but me um, and <laughs> you got the secondhand smoke that was <laughs> yeah but it was it was horrible in that little tight space Mm. So I, uh, at one point, I just went, I took my sticks, threw them down on the on the floor, and I said, "God, you guys are killing me with your cigarettes." I opened the door and walked out and took some deep breaths. And Tom came out and and said, "Yeah, but it's better than working in a factory somewhere." So my wife's an artist, and I took some of her her uh, oil paints. We got a little piece of trim wood about one. It's a one by four and i wrote the factory on it and i nailed it on the door so when they came to rehearsal the next day there there it was so when we got our our headquarters when when we had a hit we had a biz, real business and we needed a place to rehearse and to do our business and we got this place a wooden old wooden structure uh, and uh, that became cosmos factory that's awesome. Your nickname is uh, what were the exact origins of that? That uh, came from uh, my, my college days. And in, in college, uh, they called me Clifford C. Clifford. We were supposed to be a fraternity, but we weren't. We weren't fraternity type guys. We were party type guys, and we had been kicked off campus. So we, there was no adult supervision, and everybody wanted to come to our parties because they were real parties. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, somebody I, I, I was we and we had an ant and roach problem because guys just took half their hamburger they didn't like to, <laughs> or you, you have vermin <laughs> living on in there and. Uh, 
not, not a pretty thing. And I have a, a background in entomology. And so I, I knew I had studied uh, colony insects and that would be ants, wasps, uh, oh. termites and bees. And so we had two of them. We had we had the, the roaches and, and the ants and they had uh, put uh, some uh, uh, pest control people in and they could never get rid of the ants, could never do it. And so I had a meeting and, I, uh, and uh, I said, I can do it. I can get rid of it and I need, I'll need to get some poison. And then you could buy deadly poison in a hardware store by the gallon. So I did all my, my baiting and uh, worked it for two weeks and, uh, and then two, after two weeks. And I, knew, I told them it'll take two weeks. And... Uh, they were gone. All of it was gone. I said, now you guys have to empty your garbage cans. Uh, otherwise, it's, nothing's going to change. And so that worked. So anyway, we were at this party and somebody yelled out, hey, Clifford, see Clifford, what does the C stand for? And before I could respond, the first hippie in the house said, it stands for Cosmo. He's cosmic. He's a man of ma nature. <laughs> cool. Like like poop on the shoe. It, it's yeah. it, Stu doesn't call me Doug, uh, calls me Cos or Cosmo. Same with the guys in the band. They called me Cos or Cosmo. Um, so uh, if, if um, it was uh, a nickname that uh, will, is, will be around my neck of the woods for, for the rest of my life. So <laughs> I, I, I do like it. So that, that part's good. <laughs> It's funny how that just sticks like that too. So, what was life uh, like in El Cerrito? What was it like back in the six days? Oh, <laughs> Must have been fascinating. <laughs> least logical pl place, or at least likely place, to uh, have a, a southern rock style music uh, bathed in the blues. Uh, coming out of this little bedroom community and but that's where we all lived and went to school and we started in the eighth grade as, as an instrumental trio and then uh, Tom came in uh, he was in a band and he wanted to uh, uh, cut a demo and go to LA and try and get it a record deal his band didn't want to do it because they weren't getting paid he was paying for everything uh, and uh, there weren't going to be any chicks there. So they said they would rather work on their cars. That's a somewhat prototypical <laughs> El Cerrito musician. And uh, uh, so we were able, though, to listen to real R&B radio. So I listened to a lot of uh, black music by the the old blues guys, Muddy Waters and, and uh, people like that. And... Uh, uh, so and the real country stuff uh, there was a, a kind of a, a, a melting pot of, of people that came out during the war there was a big uh, shipyard there and they they needed uh, people uh, to run it because uh, the, all the, uh, the the troops were in, in uh, you know in the places there they had gone to fight so they needed uh, they needed a work base and so people came from all over and a lot of people came from the south and once they got out and lived in california for a while they didn't want to go back to the south and they the, and after the war the the ship yard was still there so they, they had uh, work and so they brought their their uh, their tools and their music and uh, they gave us a, a good foundation for what we the direction we were going in Wow. Well, wow. it must have been just like, just fascinating, just getting it all together and just growing up in that, those neck of the woods. Do you remember seeing the Beatles for the first time, like so many of your generation? Oh, yeah. And that was a big shot in the arm for us because we had been together for about six years or so and nothing had come from it. And, uh, and uh, uh, maybe a, a, an air, some airplane on a radio station for a, for a day or two. But uh, when we saw them on Ed Sullivan, uh, they were playing American rock and roll better than the American rock and rollers. And, uh, you know, and they had the same instrumentation that we did, 
there's three guitars and drums and and we just looked at him and, and we looked at ourselves and we said, if these guys from Liverpool can, can come in here and, you know, have number one hits, we can do it too. We, we wanted it. And that gave us a big, big uh, shot in the arm. And uh, sure enough, we end up going back for our first trip to Europe, go into the Beatles house and played the Royal Albert Hall, which is now a documentary uh, of, on Credence that for your, your, your listeners out there, uh, uh, it's really good. It's really well done. Uh, it has our entire show uh, from the Royal Albert Hall, plus three, three songs from Woodstock. And most people don't know that we played Woodstock, but we did. Mm. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, uh, Oakland Coliseum. That was our back, our backyard. That's where Elvis played, and that's where Elvis uh, tipped his cap to us, knowing that the, the, we were there, and, and and that was our backyard. That was one of the biggest thrills of my career, having Elvis. Uh, here's here's how he did it. Uh, the the people that did his tours did our tours as well, and they were like the top. Uh, company that to do it they had four acts they had elvis presley they had credence clearwater revival they had the beach boys and frank sinatra those were their four wow. acts they had <laughs> so elvis was coming to our neck of the woods and and uh and uh, the, uh, the the fellow that we toured with it was concerts west was the name of the com company he said, Elvis wants to meet you guys. He's a, he's a big fan of yours. Said, what? Elvis mm -hmm. wants to meet us? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we, we go to the show, and he, that's when he was trim and, and wearing the white leather. And, uh, oh, man, it was just so cool. And he had just finished a song, uh, and then he, he comes up to the microphone, and he says, I know they're out there. I know they're out there. This is for the Credence Boys, two, three, four, and he plays Proud Mary. Wow. Oh, that's kind of, yeah, how that song's been covered. I was bawling. I, I, I was just, uh, yeah, I think <laughs> all of us were. <laughs> Doesn't get any better. Building before we could meet him. <laughs> nice. He, did, he gave us the tip of the hat and played played our, our song. So that, that's that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wow. What a career. Gosh, that's, uh, that's definitely the pinnacle of all of that. But, uh, you know, some of our favorites you work with, uh, I believe Steve Miller as well. Steve Miller is one of my best friends. In oh. fact, I just got an email from Steve. Uh, I sent him a copy of the California Gold, and he just says, man, uh, keep it up, buddy, is what he said. And he said, we need to, we need to communicate more. And uh, so I'll be sending him an email later today. Oh, wow. Just starting on Rock and May, that's, you had to know that's a hit. Like the minute that thing's like putting together, I mean, there, there must be that moment where like, this, this is going to just crack the top five easily. Well, I, I have a st story on that. Uh, I was over at his house and I was going to go over to Nebworth Castle in Eng England and uh, play. He, he was... Uh, his contract was up so he put together a kind of a super band uh, four piece band but super band to go market and uh, he says you're not in, in, in you guys aren't going to be in, in the band but you know just say you're in, in the band because we, we played one show and that was the Nebworth Castle so uh, I'm at Steve's house and and the and, and, uh, Lonnie Taylor, his bass player, was, was going to join, join us. Uh, and and then Les Dudak, the guitarist, was going to play. And he didn't show up. So it was just Steve and I. And we, we rehearsed 22 songs, just the two of us. And he, he says, I, yeah. I want to play my next single. You, you want to hear it? And I said, yeah. He says, tell me what you think. So he, he plays Rockin' Me Baby. And, and the tempo was was up uh -huh. it, it, instead of this it was and so he, play, he played it for me. I said what do you think and I says 
I think you need to slow that tempo. Now think about what you're doing here. Mm. You know, you're not rocking a baby. Yeah. And you, you know, you're rocking your baby, your 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 lover. Your you know, this is a this is a, a sexy song, and and so you need to you know, slow that slow that thing down. He says, yeah, thanks." So, first time it was ever played in public was that show in England, and uh, the tempo uh, is was the tempo I I, I gave Steve to. To, to play that song in it. So I, 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 I know that song pretty well. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. The minute you hear that, it's just really incredible. Uh, it was like getting together with Stu Cook and getting together in the Don Harrison band. Well, yeah, the Don Harrison band was, Don was not a professional. He, he it was bigger than he was and, and he couldn't handle it. And uh, every time we'd go out and play a gig, he'd lose his voice. That's really bad. We opened for the Rolling Stones at Nebworth, a, a, a different uh, different year. But we uh, opened for him, and sure enough, in about the third song, Don's voice was gone. And then he's apologizing to the audience. That's the worst thing you can do. So uh, I had a, a real stiff neck after playing that show because I had my head down. Oh gosh, yeah, you just feel that. That's oh, terrible. And the and the Don Harrison, but Russell DeShield came out of that band, and he's he's my my partner in in, in uh, uh, this project, and uh, some others as well because he's he's aside from being a really good lead guitar player, he's very technically sound, and I am not. I know I know what the, these things can do, and 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 I know what I, what I want from them, and I'll, but I just have to articulate that to Russell, and Russell will do the, the work. He's got the, the the chops for the for the for the technical stuff, so he's on on this this record. He's the executive uh, producer. Nice, nice. Almost thirty years since you were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What was what was that experience like? Uh, just going to the Hall of Fame. Well, it was pretty, pretty, pretty sad, actually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know you never thought they would like make something like you know this this tribute to you know rock and roll was not supposed to be so corporate, but yeah, here well, it, it is. It, 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 John refused to play with us. So instead of playing with us, he played he, 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 with Bruce Springsteen, Robbie Robertson, and uh, mm -hmm. forget who the drummer was, one of the, the studio guys there. And we, it was one of the most insulting, insipid things and, and cheap things. That, uh, there, were, there was only one guy in, in, being inducted in and, and, and there were two guys that were being inducted weren't allowed to play yeah uh, it's, it's just so political the whole thing is can be yeah. just like you know why isn't so and so in this why is this person in there it just like it really creates all this tension yeah well there was some tension it was pretty real sad we had our, our families our kids and it just pulled the rug out from under you that was vintage fogarty at the time and I'm hoping I think he's getting a little, little uh, uh, mellower these days. He doesn't seem to. Uh, when we if we communicate with him, it's through his lawyer. So wow, well, well hopefully things do get better become, with age. You know, love letters become pretty expensive. But uh, we we did some uh, inter during the now. Uh, plugging the uh, the uh, uh, Royal Albert Hall, and uh, he he did an interview and, and it was it wasn't negative, so that's kind of a first. And so hopefully, you know, we 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 can just not have to have that hanging over our heads. I'm not saying I want to go play with him. I I I don't, but. Uh, I've got Parkinson's right uh, right now, and we had a band, Creedence Clearwater Revisited, Stu and I, 25 years. We just uh, retired that two years ago, and so uh, that's why I'm doing this. This is, this is my label, too, by the way, Cliffsong Records. 
so oh. it'll be the first uh, uh, record company that I've been, been uh, involved with that I won't have to audit. Very good. <laughs> good stuff in the vault. I, I guess, is there a lot more in the vault that you can dig out? There is. There is more in there, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of keep that as a, a secret until it's time to come out. Yeah, yeah, kind of like you know, was in JD Salinger keeping a whole bunch of stuff in vaults and stuff hasn't been released, but there's a whole bunch of gold out there, I'm sure. So, really great release. I feel like there's a real Clapton y uh track on there. It's uh one that notice uh that I know it's called Always It's Always Darkest Before the Dawn. It just kind of oh, reminds yeah. me of that. That's uh, the, the, the my opinion as a song, uh. It's the best song that that we we did, and uh, that was, uh, you know, that's where I, I took the lyrical uh, uh, reins on that one. And excuse me, we've had f fires around here in the, the oh, area. Gosh. We had some rain, and otherwise I, I would need two of these. But uh, yeah, Darkest for the Dawn, I think, is the best song there. And it's played really, really well. It's it's uh, a ballad, if you will. And the message is, is, is positive, positive, but it's, it's also it's a very true thing involved with it because, you know, it, it might seem to, to, to be as bad as it's going to get, but that's uh, anything that happens after that in a positive way is, is what that song's about. And it's always darkest for the dawn, but you know, that, that darkness will go away. You just have to, you have to, have to hang in there, mm. weather the storm. Yeah, wow. Well, hopefully out in your way, um, things will cool down. I know it's been a crazy hot summer. It's just, uh, seems like it's getting warmer every year so. Hopefully things will be a little better for all of us. I'm over here in Atlanta, so things are hopefully cooling off. We're getting into autumn, so that's a little bit better. But uh, I do wish you the best and uh, hopefully more stuff to come out of the vault. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I what I need is, uh, is airplay. Uh, yeah. Because when I, in these interviews, I talk to guys that uh, – uh, I, I I listened to it and then I you know caught myself going back and listened to it three times. They said it's like a it's like a new record and 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 the, the you know Bobby's vocals are spot on. I mean the be, I think it's the best vocals he's ever done, uh, and uh, it, it's it's you know it's just pure rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, you've known Bobby for for a long time. He also worked with Todd Rundgren. I noticed I was on listening to one of his projects. Bobby Whitlock's been everywhere. Just an amazing, really yeah. huge talent. Oh, ter terrific, ter terrific talent. And he he did his best work, I think, uh, on 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 this record, and uh, it's, it's, it was a lot of fun to to, to do it. Yeah, I urge people to go out there, get this. This is a really amazing release. Uh, great songs rolling on. You got some really groovy stuff here. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, uh, turn wow. the beat around. Turn the beat. I, I just like, ah, yeah, it is. It's fresh. It's timeless. It's not something yeah, that's just told me. Yeah. <laughs> very, very well done. Well, I really appreciate your time and uh, best wishes in all your future endeavors. Oh, thanks, Robert. Take care. Have a good one. You do the same. Sure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.